All right. Well, it's 1120, so I guess we can get started. Um, well, hello and good morning, um, everyone. My name is Jillian Swanovic. I am the graduate assistant for the Center for Sports Media Marketing. Um, and as you know, today we have a very exciting topic to be analyzed by professionals in the media and sports industries. Um, so first, I would like to introduce Andy Conti, who is the director for the Center for Sports, or for, excuse me, the Center for Media Innovation. Um, and they are co-hosting the event today with the Center for Sports Media Marketing. Um, so Andy and panelists, thank you all for being here today. And I'll send it over to you. All right, thank you. It is confusing. We've got too many centers here at Point Park. Uh, but the, the Center for Media Innovation, uh, for those of you who don't know, serves as a laboratory for the present and future of journalistic storytelling. And one of the things we like to do is host events like this for uh, students and for the public to give them some better sense of how the media process works and how journalism works. And so we're especially thrilled with today's discussion. I want to give you a heads up too, we're having a, another conversation on October 29th with uh, Selena Zito, who is a political columnist and uh, for CNN and the Wall Street Journal and the Washington Examiner. And so we'll have more details coming on that, but that'll be our next big event this fall. I have the, the privilege today of introducing someone who uh, was a, when I'm back in my reporting days, was a sometimes hostile source, but most often a helpful source. And uh, uh, someone who uh, you know has, has has been a big help to me over the years. Uh, Tom McMillan, of course, is the vice president for communications at the Pittsburgh Penguins, and before that, he was a, a newspaper reporter, a sports reporter here at the Post Gazette in Pittsburgh for many years. And the great thing about Tom is that he never forgot where he came from. Uh, Tom is a, a graduate of, of Point Park University, I believe, 1978. Is that right, Tom? Back in the yeah. Stone Age. Oh, go back in the Stone Ages, yeah, the typewriter ages, we could say. And, yeah, uh, for sure, and, for sure. Yeah, and uh, of course now he he heads up, co-hosts the uh, Center for Sports Media and Marketing. Did I get that right? Yeah. Yeah. So, okay, Tom, thanks so much for uh, well, being here today. Thank you, Andy, and thanks for the nice comments and congr congratulations on your doctorate. It's a little odd to call you Doctor Conti, but uh, but well deserved. So, congratulations on. On that, yeah, I had actually called uh, my old friend Andy this summer after experience we had been through because I thought uh, we we normally do events on general topics or theory, but this is one where where we have a case study of something that just happened in Pittsburgh that people went through. How do you do sports media during a pandemic? There was no textbook, um, and this is certainly even before the bu bubble. How do you do it in Pittsburgh? So we wanted to get together. Uh, to use the Penguins experience to get some Penguins uh, communications folks and some local media folks to get all sides of how we put this, this was new for all of us. So I'll introduce our, our panel right now, uh, led off by uh, Jennifer Bellano Ridgely, who's uh, VP of communications for the Penguins oversees all communications efforts there. She is a uh, Point Park master's graduate from 2007. Jen was a Penguins intern and obviously worked her way up to the executive office. So that's an interesting career path. Uh, joining her, Evan Shaw, our director of communications at the Penguins. He's also a Point Park graduate, undergrad in, uh, in 2014. Evan actually was, was our only representative in the quote bubble for about 10 days. And uh, he also was a Penguins intern. So I think there's, there's a little lesson here for you students out of here. We have two people working for the Penguins who were Penguins interns. Internships can lead to jobs. They often do. You, you notice you get good people in an organization and you want, you want to hire them. So it's a great path. From the media side, we have Rob Rossi, uh, veteran, a hockey columnist and, and writer for The Athletic now. Uh, Rob, of course, previously worked for the Post-Gazette and the Trib and the City Paper. We always used to uh, joke that anyone who paid, but he is, he is a veteran, well-respected writer and is the president of the local hockey writers association so is very much involved in these kinds of negotiations and andrew stocky from the from the tv side uh again long time uh veteran uh, which is which is a compliment andrew uh, sports and news uh, anchor and reporter at wta in pittsburgh so thank you all for joining us i think you know it, it's gonna be a great opportunity for the students just to get a glimpse into how this happened because the one thing i realized even talking to andy as close as he was People didn't realize how this was pulled off. Uh, we had a situation where hockey got shut down on March 12th. Nothing happened for two months. Then players started skating on their own. No media access. Then it was going to be a two-week training camp. 
very limited media access, no direct access to the players. How do you pull this off? We had, we had teams desperate for coverage, reporters def, desperate for stories, and yet the overriding fact was medical safety and not getting anyone sick with COVID and getting the players to the bubble. I'll turn it over to Jen, but as we were told many times from NHL communications, we know you guys want coverage. The most important thing is to get the players safely to the bubble. So we are working in a set of rest restrictions we've never had before. So how do you pull this off? Jen, do you want to just take the students through how we kind of grappled with this at the start? Yeah, and just to give you guys a little bit of background, in the NHL, every single practice, um, the locker room opens within five minutes of the first player off the ice. So there's typically a, about a 30-minute window where the media can come in, walk around, casually talk to wh whatever players they want, Rossi and – Stocky, refrain from comments when I say things like that. They can talk to whoever they want, you know, do like have some off the record conversations and do a little bit of chatting here and there rather than one large scrum all the time. But it's usually a 30 minute window. And it's, it's crazy because as we progress into doing these different scenarios of WebExes and things like that, we would find ourselves being on WebExes for over an hour just to accommodate three people in the media at that same time. So I want to let you understand how much that changed from what was normally happening. So we were in Columbus when the stoppage started. Well, Evan was actually with the team when the stoppage came and they came home on the game day. So we had went from a complete normal operation to an absolute standstill. Um, and immediately we started talking about how can we do this? You know, we, we obviously wanted to be involved in the community. We wanted to get the guys involved and stuff like that. They were asking, they were very eager, but more importantly, how can we take care of the media? Because this is their livelihood. And um, we were very fortunate that our general manager understood that. And so we decided that we were gonna be a team that did a WebEx once a week. And it was kind of interesting because we had always had the WebEx technology, but never really used it. You know, we've done so many conference calls in the past, but when I look at Andrew, I think, I hope it helped you because having the WebEx gave a visual rather than just the audio, you know, and we've never had that opportunity before. Our biggest challenge then became how many people we could put on without it becoming too cumbersome and not being able to get to people's questions. And we took baby steps along the whole way, you know, Evan and I would have them submit their questions in advance because just like us, this whole technology was new to them. So like raising your hand and asking a question, it seemed a little overwhelming and some people didn't feel comfortable doing it. Now, in this day and age, we're also used to this virtual network. You know, I think we've accidentally stumbled on a great opportunity where now we know that we could have media availability anytime, any place, anywhere, and it's still pretty effective because it gives the audio and the visual. Jen, before I turn to the roster, can you just talk about the challenge though of of getting players available to the media in this in this context? Because yeah, so this was an uncomfortable time for them as well. Yeah, and that, that's another thing is when I say that they were available every day, it's actually part of their contract. When they're playing hockey, it's part of the CBA. It's part of what they do. It's part of their role. Well, now when we were in the pause, they had zero requirements. Like they could have told me no every single time I asked a player. Fortunately, we had a great group who understood, you know, like, hey, we're doing this in the best interest of everyone. Like we need to keep the sport of hockey relevant. You know, this is important. And I know you guys, um, I know you guys, get it because you're asking me what you can do in the community but even just having you available with a video of you saying what you've been doing during the downtime and things like that and thank god they were so responsive because like tom said they actually owed us nothing at that time and we were able to do it for weeks on end keep it going um, and then even when they started the optional skates evan and myself weren't allowed in the building our office is inside the locker room so we were not even allowed to go into the doors at upmc um, so it was a, definitely a challenge for us. Like we're talking to the players like, Hey, what time are you guys skating today? Like trying to figure out who's on the ice at what time and getting them. And the NHL was so strict. We finally did get, um, a camera in and it was weeks into it. I think it actually was the beginning of right before they started phase three where they could stand at the top, but it was one person from our group and they had to come through a completely separate entrance, get screened, get tested or get the temperature taken. And then we would put it out to share with everyone just so we had something because we didn't want to just sit back and then all of a sudden be like, okay, we're going to the bubble, you know, and there was so much uncertainty. 
just giving the fans that that interaction with the players and making them see that you know they're still training and they're going through these things personally too you know their children aren't are home from school and they don't their norm has been changed as well so I think it was really great and it's a testament to our players and how much they understand you know that their role is off the ice as well. Rob, I want to throw it to you uh, first and, and, and Andrew. During this period where the players were skating informally, but there was no media access to the building, PR couldn't get in, writers couldn't get in. Uh, what was that like? What were your concerns? And, and, and I know you and Jen talked a lot about how we would negotiate through this and, and work it well for both sides. Yeah, well, I mean, as Jen said, um, I don't, you know, to reiterate, I'm used to, you know, every day uh, during the hockey season, uh, seeing these these guys and, and talking to them, asking them questions, whether it's for a story or to set up a story. So, um, you know, to not have that was was a concern of how are we going to as a media, and I was primarily concerned with the writers, um, how are we going to sort of keep people, lack of a better way, employed? Um, you know, when this thing shut down, I remember telling somebody, I was in New Jersey the last day the Penguins played, and I remember telling somebody the next morning on the phone, a member of the media, I'll see you in six months. Um, it, and, and what I meant by that was, I have no idea when I'm going to see you again. Um, and, you know, I think one of the things I, I decided early, uh, and we at the Professional Hockey Writers decided early, sort of nationally, but also locally, was nobody was going to take more of a hit than the writers because we were the ones that probably benefited the most from the open locker room sessions, but for the betterment of the sport, for the betterment of the media as a whole, and for really the future of our industry, we felt like we had to be very open to not being uh, combative about whatever we were offered by the teams and the league. So um, I took the approach of anything is better than nothing. And even though it's going to be a difficult thing to get, you know, unique content, um, it's better to have access. And so when, you know, Jen and I had our first conversation, I was very pleased that I was able to sort of talk to the local writers association members and say, look, we're going to be getting something and, you know, we're going to have to figure out how to, make it work for us individually but you know we are going to be getting something and it's going to be one of these situations and i stress this from the first conversation to the ones i've had with them through when they were in the bubble was look um it's an evolving situation and it it it's not ideal for anybody so we've just got to make the best of it and that was basically andrew, my can you, andrew can you kind of give the uh the same question, but from the TV perspective, is this is starting your concerns and how it started to work out as we all kind of try to navigate? Well, obviously in television, the difference that uh, from, from, from Rob and the writers is we need video. We need visuals. I mean, boners don't work. Uh, quotes don't work. We need to see the athlete. We need to see the team on the ice. Um, I have to uh, thank uh, Jen and Evan and the entire Penguin staff for making that happen. But, you know, it's interesting, the Penguins were doing that long before we had the pandemic. I mean, we've worked with Penn's TV for a long time, which helped us quite a bit when the team was on the road. So we had post-game interviews sometimes. We had visuals uh, when we couldn't get to the morning skate. So that was already built into the system. We knew that we could rely on the team to get us something. Uh, as Rob mentioned, the challenge is original content uh, because everybody's talking to the same person. You hear everybody's questions. Uh, there is really nothing that you're going to get that uh, someone else isn't going to get so you know and obviously you can't shoot your own practice video which is another another concern as well i mean we like to have our own stuff we like to get certain ices of certain players and what have you um but given the situation we were in and of course we face this really with every team we cover the pirates the steelers uh the, the schools and universities um you know we we had to find a way to get something on the air and tell the story of what was going on and when hockey would return when baseball would return would football start up so uh, from a television point of view, no, we didn't get original content, but we were getting content on television. And that was the most important thing. The Penguins, every day that you had a player available, every day you made practice video available, it was getting you in front of the fans. And people wanted to see that. 
people were hungry to see hockey again. They were hungry to see baseball again. And then when finally the season resumed, you know, it, it felt a little more normal. We got, we kind of got used to this now. Uh, I think part of the success of, of what you've been doing, Jen and Evan, and with the whole Penguin organization is the fact that people have become accustomed now to Zoom. They're accustomed to WebEx. Seeing this on television isn't so jarring anymore. We're, we're used to it now. Uh, and in many ways, uh, in, in some respects, at least this is how I feel, we get more sometimes out of the athlete in this format because it's interesting. They, they actually, you know, in a one-on-one, -on -one, I think, uh, I see what you're shaking your head, Rob. Sometimes it's amazing. I've, I've done a few one-on-ones with athletes through this, and it's amazing. Sometimes they're actually more comfortable in talking, which is kind of weird. Uh, I, I know that's not preferable. We'd rather be right in front of them, but and sometimes because you're in, a, in another room, you're not in front of lights, in front of microphones, sometimes you open up a little bit. I will say to, to Andrew's point, we got a lot more than I think any of us expected. It was different type of more. Obviously, you didn't get the sort of, um, uh, you know, specific questions. But I will say, I think a lot of the players opened up more um, as, as, the, as they did it maybe, you know, the second time around. Um, and they mm -hmm. seemed more open to sort of uh, loose, I don't know, Jen, loose and fun questions. Uh, the first wave, when we first started talking to people, Tom, was what you were doing during the pandemic, how you were getting used to it. And then the second wave, sort of when we got to talk to people a second and third time as, you know, we got closer to everything, phase three, um, it, was, it was more, we could ask, you know, fun questions. I, and I think we had to because we, we weren't really watching practice to ask about. And Andrew, I hope uh, we have enough time at the end. I do want you to uh, talk a little bit eventually about the Pirates and the Steelers and the differences. They're not from the teams, but the sports. If you look at baseball, football, and college football that you mentioned are all outdoors. Mm -hmm. Hockey's indoors. Mm -hmm. As we know from a little that we lay people know about the, about the pandemic, it, there's more of a danger indoors. So we were also mm -hmm. dealing with that. And in the middle of July, when a two-week training camp opened, uh, up at the UPMC Lemieux Sports Complex in Cranberry mm -hmm. and at, at markets around the league. Um, we were allowed to open to limited media, but it had to be properly spaced. Uh, you know, you, you had to work out all those restrictions. And this was different in every market. Once they got to the bubble, it was easy because the NHL ran it. But now you had in 30 different markets, 30 different situations. And Jen, do you kind of want to just, uh, Jen and Evan, you want to talk uh, soon through how we had to figure that out, how many people we could get in and what we then did with cameras and still photographers? Because it was the first access, but it wasn't normal access. Yeah, I mean, one of the biggest challenges was um, we're a team that's fortunate to get good media coverage, and we had people that wanted to be there. But here's another thing where it was just a total gray area from the NHL because some people have practice facilities that have seating the whole way around. Some people have practice facilities have no seating. And as a new facility, we designed a space up top for media. Um, but when we did the measurements, it worked out that a dozen was going to be our cap, you know. And so we immediately started, you know, lo three local TVs. Penn's TV needed a seat because they were providing footage for everyone else. And then one of the challenges there with the TVs were, are they going to send a reporter or are they going to send a camera? Because, you know, like Andrew was saying, do you want your own footage or do you rely on what we're giving you and then have a camera there or a reporter there to give his own, you know, insight to what he saw or what happened. And that was a big challenge for us. And obviously, you know, we understood just from our own standpoint, we had one social and one Pence TV and it was because we needed to provide still images for the papers and we need to provide video for the television. So for us, we understood like what a, what a struggle it was deciding who should be there and who shouldn't. And then we went with our beat writers, you know, we at and Sportsnet, even though they were doing most of their stuff on a social online platform, they're still our rights holders. You know, we couldn't say like, oh, you can't be here because you're not airing a game. So we gave them a seat, you know, and it was crazy to see even our own in-house broadcasters like, you know, there are employees of the Pittsburgh Penguins, Josh Getzoff, Mike Lang, Phil Bork. They all three had to decide who was going to come because it was one seat per day. And that's something we've never put them in a position like that before, where like Dan Potash, Steve Mears, and Bob Airy were debating, you know, who was coming what day of the week because it was limited. And it was tough. We know that other teams had about three or four people that they could fit, and some had like over 20, you know, and it was just something that really took a toll because – 
but I will say everyone was very understanding. And every day that the media came in, they had an assigned seat. They got their temperatures checked. They weren't allowed to bring outside food or drink in. We did have to even get as far to say, yes, Rob, you can bring a water bottle because our own water fountains were disabled in the building as a safety precaution. You know, we had a designated restroom that they could use and a path that they walked up and down and same doors to enter and exit. So as much as, you know, you think like, oh, how big of a deal is it to have 12 people in the building? A huge deal. I mean, it was Evan and I were allowed to um, be inside the bubble now at this point with the players who so are allowed back in our office, but we could not associate with the media at all. Like we would go out to put the sign in sheets in the morning and then Evan and I would wear gloves and have to put the stuff out sanitize the table we, i would literally change the pens every day like put a whole thing of pens there so that when they were filling out their questionnaires so it seemed like tedious but it was all for the greater good because we would never made it to the bubble healthy and that was the biggest fear that doing this could expose someone and ruin it for everyone and yeah that was and, the, and, that was the, yeah, and, evan do you want to you kind of because you kind of I came was, back and you were designated to go into to eventually go to the toronto bubble right <laughs> Um, yeah, I was just going to say to add to that, like you, you figure at that point where we're allowing the media into these practices, we were about a week or two away from going to the bubble. And at that point, you know, because Jen and I were around the players, we were being tested daily. You know, we were we were being told like, you know, if, if Rob was there and had a question for us, we couldn't go up and talk to him. We had to stay away completely, you know, and that was at that point, you know, we were avoiding human contact pretty much as much as possible leading up to the bubble. And um, like Jen said, it wasn't ideal, but um, I think we made it work to the best that we could. Um, and I think you saw that transition over once we got into the bubble. Um, Jen and I sort of were running and overseeing how we were doing media before we went. And once we got there, the NHL kind of took over. So um, our role, well, I guess my role, because I was there, shifted from, you know, sort of choosing what players you know helping choose what players would talk or be available to the media um then transition to sort of being the liaison between the nhl and our team and our media was you know the nhl would say hey we need two to four guys on this day or we need you know three guys today um and so i would do my best to work with with jen who was was back home and also with rob um who was sort of our point of contact for all of you know our local media um to help figure out you know who was going to be available on practice days who was going to be available on game days um and same thing it was done just like this through zoom um and they would have you know question and answer sessions with the media that were moderated by you know nhl pr so one thing i would add is when we got to that point we were a little bit further ahead of the game which we were surprised like pleasantly surprised to see like they were like oh we only need two players today we were giving like three to four players a day so to see that, it was kind of a surprise to us. Evan and I were like, oh, well, our guys are ready. They didn't give us any fuss. And honestly, we had already started plans of how we would do one-on-ones, like for the local TVs and get things back. And unfortunately, the ending just didn't go the right way because we were already thinking that. We brought backdrops and stuff that we never got to use. Tom, unfortunately. if I could say real quick, too, uh, I'll keep it really quick. Once we got to phase three, which was – returning to cover practices, which everybody's been talking about. Right away, I realized that the situation was gonna force a, a real change in approach to the way I did the job. Um, at the beginning of the phase three, Josh, Yoey, and I, who I work with to cover the Penguins, so we're kind of, we're partners, right? Only one of us could be there a day. And we had set up a schedule every other day, right? Um, and I remember even sharing that with Jen and Evan. And eventually what happened was I stopped going. And here's why. Um, to me, the benefit of watching practice was not as great as being at home for the you know, hour of interviews that we were going to get. They were giving us about three players and the coach every day. And it was taking about an hour to hear from everybody. And I wanted to be on those calls um, because I wanted to gather as much information as I could. And you know, it really started, I wasn't aware of it at the time, but it really started preparing me for even when they got to the bubble, the team, um, obviously I'm going to be going from writing about games and being there to writing off TV, which is very different. Um, but in a way, 
it, it started training me to think differently because I wasn't in a normal environment where I would be sort of uh, shooting the breeze with uh, other members of the media or, or Jen or Evan or Tom or whomever. Uh, and so it was, it was very interesting how right away there was an opportunity to sort of necessarily change the way we had to do our job with the media because weirdly as it sounds for a hockey writer, watching hockey during the practices was not the most important thing for a lot of us. And when there were scrimmages, they were on Penn's TV or YouTube. So I could sit at home and watch them. And again, be in a better situation to talk to people on the, on the uh, video calls. One of the strategic things I wanted to get into was uh, as, as we had to, as Jen and Evan had to set up how we were going to do training camp with the 12 people allowed in, the NHL also didn't want a lot of cameras down by the ice. They wanted the people sitting in the back row. So we just made the determination. We knew that all reporters, and we would have a Penn's TV camera shoot, as Jen said, and a still photographer shoot the photos and provide those every day on a loop to the TV stations and to the local media outlets. Andrew, how did that work out? I mean, I know it's not ideal. You'd have rather had your own videographer there, right. but in the right. absence of that, was it okay? No, it was fine. I mean, uh, you know, most times the video we got were was uh, players perhaps that we had a chance to talk to uh, that day or earlier in the week. Um, yeah, and we would compile all the video that we got so that we were talking about, let's say, Evgeny Malkin. You know, if, we, if he talked that day, at least we had video of him from a couple of days ago. So it did work. We were able to compile video and have a library uh, instead of going back and showing game video from, uh, you know, previous when the season was underway. So it did work out. I mean, again, Every journalist wants their own material, whether it be sound, whether it be video. But this was a situation where clearly we, we couldn't do that. Uh, and as I said before, having worked with Penn's TV before, uh, at least you knew the quality of material you were getting. You knew if you needed more stuff or you needed a certain player or whatever, you could probably reach out and get it. So it worked out well. Yeah, I, I think we had to be aware of that too within the bubble um, because obviously there were no media there at all, um, right. no, no media practices. Um, you could get credentialed to go to games, but you were sitting way up top. There was really no benefit to doing that. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we had to be aware of that when we were in the bubble as well. And I think, you know, each team was required to send one, you know, like social content person. Um, and I think we collectively as an organization decided that a camera person was was the best decision um and so i you know we had brian one of our pens tv cameraman yeah he was there he was shooting stuff from practice he was you know like shooting some behind the scenes stuff but we were we were trying to send that video out when we could um and then you know i also you know before i worked under jen and tom i worked in our social media department our new media department um so i had experience um taking photos so i sort of acted as our stand-in still photographer for while we were in the bubble, which was, um, I don't think every team had that luxury, um, just based on the number of, you know, the, the number of people you were allowed to send, I think it was 52 was the number, and that includes players, coaches, training staff, doctors, you know, so, so once you take all of those people off the list, there may only be one or two extra spots for, you know, that PR person or whoever that may be, so. If I you really can understand when you when I talk about being at a practice or covering a practice, um, we're there to watch what goes on on the ice. Um, you know, I, I mentioned talking to other reporters and that, but primarily to give you an example, if the Penguins would switch their lines for any reason, um, they might do it in the practice before a game, and we would see that. So we would go when the locker room open we'd go in and ask a question about that or we'd ask you know their head coach about you know what personnel changes might be if a player didn't practice we would know that the player didn't practice we wouldn't necessarily know why there were rules that you no no injury updates were going to be provided at all because of the um agreement between the nhl and the nhlpa not to disclose what might be or what would be a covid positive tests. So the way around that was just not talking about injuries at all. But we also, once they got to the bubble, had no idea what was really going on in practice other than honestly from following social media and following the Penguins social media because at the bubble, outside media was not allowed in even for the practices. 
So it was really flying blind and you were having to sort of take it on faith that um, when you needed to confirm something, people were going to have to sort of work with you in ways that we weren't necessarily familiar with working with each other before. Because again, the rules had all changed. Even from phase three to phase four, there was a lot of change to the rules. Andrew, before we get into what we learned and what any concerns are moving forward, because I want to get the opinions from, from both communications and reporters on that, can you just touch a little bit, you mentioned Pirates and Steelers, right. and ba every sport's different, every stadium facility is different, you know, baseball and football are outdoors. Uh, just for the students, how was it different in those settings than indoors and hockey? Well, it's interesting. I went to my first, I went to the first Pitt football game, for instance, this year. And that was very odd. It basically, there were 20 media members spaced down the press box, nobody in the stands. You heard crowd noise, but nothing was going, but there was no crowd. Uh, it was just really strange. Uh, it, you felt like they were playing for you. And that was kind of odd. Um, and then of course, you know, you really can't do anything like I normally do. Like I'm, I can't be on the field. Uh, you can't really bring a photographer to shoot highlights. They don't allow that. Same thing with the Steelers. Uh, all your interviews afterwards are Zoom. So uh, you're watching the game uh, and you're just trying to deal with this whole weird situation. Same thing with the Pirates. You go to a Pirate baseball game, you have this beautiful view of PNC Park, of course, in the city of Pittsburgh. You're in the press box, you're spaced out. Uh, you hear crowd noise uh, and you see these guys playing, but there's nobody in the stands. So we, it's really bizarre when you're at the game. Uh, you know, obviously with hockey, we didn't have that opportunity, but with uh, other sports, it's really strange to see. Um, you know, after a while you get used to it and it's just the way you do things, uh, at least you have the opportunity to still do interviews after a game. And I think all, all those teams, uh, you know, the Pirates, Penguins and Steelers have made people available relatively quickly after the game. You know, the coach talks, uh, you know, usually the top player talks, uh, other interviews. Um, we just did a Monday night football game, uh, Steelers and Giants, and we had a live post game show. And as soon as the game was over five, uh, 10 minutes afterwards, Mike Tomlin was up on zoom Ben Roethlisberger was up a few minutes later. We have seven or eight players. So, uh, you know, I, I think the teams understand what we're going through and they try to make people available as much as possible so we can do what we need to do. Um, it's still, you know, it's still not ideal and perfect, but we're in a situation where, you know, we kind of have to work together to find a way to make it work so we can accomplish our jobs and do what we need to do. You know, obviously we hope this will change, you know, maybe not by next season, maybe in seasons after that. Uh, but for now, we kind of have to work together and, and, and to accomplish goals, not just as journalists, but also as the team. For the, for the group, moving forward, and again, hopefully we get beyond this sooner rather than later, but mm -hmm. we can right. answer, we don't know. Mm -hmm. What did we learn from this, though, that we can glean positively, that, that things we, we can carry positively moving forward? That, that's for the, for, the whole, for the entire panel, both from a PR side and a reporting side. Would it have been the, the, use, the use of the video? Yeah, I learned two, I think that I, maybe three takeaways. One, um, there's always this concern about what, what normal will look like when it comes. Um, I think the fact that though we made the best of a difficult situation, it actually probably made a lot of the media access more lengthy and more um, uncomfortable for guys uh, in the room. I think that probably speaks to at least in hockey why I'm confident we will eventually get back to at least having, if nothing else, players brought out from the locker room so we can talk to them if we're in the arena. Um, but the other thing I learned is, you know, when, and this will happen every hockey season, there'll be a flu will hit the team. Sometimes you get the mumps. Um, this technology now allows on those days where it might not make sense to, open the locker room because things are spreading. I think this gives us an option to maybe do some things that the technology provides uh, that maybe we wouldn't have. And the big thing I think is we've gotten used to this conversation method with video. Um, and so I, I'm, I think, you know, for when something happens when they're not playing games, if the Penguins make a trade or they sign a player, you know, we used to have a, a video or a phone call and everybody would sort of dial into this line that Jen or Evan set up and that's how you did the interview. But I would think going forward because it could just give a better look and also it allows us to read what's going on in a player's mind or 
read his face, not say what's going on in his mind. You know, I think as we get more towards seeing people when we talk to them, even in non-traditional at the arena settings, I think that's going to be more likely going forward. Um, and I, I think that's better. That's better for everybody, the media, the fans, the teams, everything. But I'm not worried that we're not ever going to be have sort of open access again because I don't, I don't think players want to have to do the Zoom, the Skype, uh, unless they have to. I think it's a game changer for us during the season. Say it's an off day and someone gets signed or, you know, there's something that happens and someone gets called up, but it's someone that the media would really want to talk to. And maybe there's no availability in the morning or something, you know, it allows us an opportunity to have availabilities at unconventional times, you know, maybe, maybe it gives us different options. Whereas in the past we've been so, you know, tied into the, the rooms open, it's general availability. Now maybe it gives us an opportunity, like if the team's on the road for a week and the local media that's not traveling wants something, maybe there's an opportunity to do something just for the locals via, you know, a WebEx or a Zoom. And then that gives them stuff that they wouldn't have had in the past, you know, and these are all things that we're open to now. I mean, we've started doing this stuff with fan engagements, you know, with players called season ticket holders, some corporate sponsors, some happy hours, they enjoyed it. And they've told us, you know, when I'm sitting in a hotel room, like I don't mind engaging with the fans. Cause that's what, you know, there's a probably a little bit of a blur of what you think really happens on the road, but we spend a lot of time just hanging out with each other and, you know, sitting in hotel rooms. And so we've, we've discovered a lot of new things that, you know, we may be able to put to work once there's some sort of normalcy coming back into the sport of hockey. You know, I agree with Jen and Rob about, you know, the uh, availability now, especially, you know, if you if you acquire a player, you know, you don't have to wait till maybe the morning skate the next day. You can actually talk to them that day. Uh, so from that point of view, at least from a television point of view, that certainly helps. I think the thing that I've learned is um, to be adaptable. Um, you know, it's funny. If you would ask me what Zoom was back on March 13th, I couldn't tell you. Never heard of it. Didn't know anything about it. And now that's an integral part of what we do every single day. I mean, the way I do my job now is completely different. I mean, yes, I would love to, you know, go to games or, or go to practices or whatever, but now, you know, you can do everything on your computer. You can talk to people, you can get the information. Um, it, it, it's really been a game changer in terms of getting people and talking to people and being able to, uh, if you're doing a story away from the team and you want to reach out to maybe a former player or something, you're more likely to be able to call, get them on Zoom and talk to them right then and there. Uh, so I think we've all learned to be very, very adaptable. I mean, I hope this doesn't continue. I hope at some point we get back to whatever, as Rob said, the normal is. And that's tough to say what it's going to be or when it's going to happen. Uh, but at least now we know when things like this occur, we can change with the technology and we, do it, we can do it quicker. I remember when uh, we first started our, our website here at Channel 4 back in the late 90s, early 2000s. I mean, people were very slow to adapt to the whole idea of, of a website. And then wait a minute, we're gonna post a story at three o'clock you know, our news is at five o'clock, uh, you know, and people in the beginning didn't get that. Now they do. So I think we've all become much more flexible and able to adapt to technology and use it to, uh, to help us do our job, probably maybe even a little bit better than we were before. I think also, Tom, the important thing is, I think over the years, and, and you, know, you and Jen would have a better perspective on this than anybody, there's been this sort of complete um, lack of awareness of what, from media members, most media members don't really understand what the role of communications employees are. Um, you'll hear a lot of, that. well, they're not, you know, they work for us. And what really, you know, Jen, Jen kind of works for everybody, you know, um, uh, but, you know, she has to answer to a general manager, a coach, players, and deal with media who have needs. And that's, that's not even getting into other stuff she has to do. I do think it sort of forced us to all see, look at each other's jobs from the other person's perspective. And I'm really hopeful we can keep that in mind because that actually made it easier to cover the team, not from a positive or negative coverage standpoint. I think in a weird way, being away from each other allowed us to humanize ourselves because we had to sort of think about each other and what you were dealing with and what was going on in your situation compared to when you just get into a routine of showing up, being tired, showing up, being tired, showing up, being tired. I think Rob hit it right on the head. I think there's better communication now. 
than perhaps there was before. We're actually, we talk to each other probably a little bit more. You know, when we need something, when, when you need something, we actually talk to one another. And it's hard to believe in the communication business that was ever, that's ever a problem. But I think the, the lines are much more open and you're much more willing to say what you need and be, and also share a little bit more. So in that regard, I think it's, that's been a, a big game changer that we're talking more. Yeah. Yeah. And I then from a Penguin standpoint, we sent Evan to the bubble to bring back the Stanley Cup. He <laughs> failed miserably. He lost in the preliminary round. Failed. I can't back. believe you haven't been but, traded, Evan. I mean, you're the one that's the problem. <laughs> Jen and I said going into the tournament, they can't win because we're not there. We're always there if they win. Let's be honest. Oh, so it's your fault. <laughs> my five yeah. girl home, I would have been gone for 64 days. No doubt we would have won the whole thing. It's my fault. Yeah. I take full responsibility. <laughs> I, I packed for two months. You know, but Evan, like, from your perspective, as someone who's relatively new to business, you've, you've heard all this. What what did you glean from this? What, what's your perspective coming out of it, of uh, the things we can learn, things we did learn, maybe things we should do better? Um, f well, first I'll say, you know, that, you know, with, with Tampa winning last night, I, I, I can't imagine, I couldn't imagine being any of those staff or players or coaches that have, that have spent the last two months in, in the bubble. Um, you know, like I, I think you said in the beginning, Tom, I might have spent like 12 days maybe. And, and it felt it felt like a long time. Um, but, you know, I think that that's what was necessary to, to get the season done. And obviously the league did an exceptional job. You know, you saw no positive cases over thousands of tests over, you know, 60 plus days. So they did it right. Um, you know, I think I think takeaways, you know, from me was, you know, I think that it, it's I, I think that, you know, like Jen said, a lot of these guys do get it, you know, and if they seem to really understand it from, you know, the beginning, even like in like April and May when they didn't know us anything, they didn't need to be available. They didn't need to be around, um, but they were. And then, you know, you saw that going into the bubble too. It was, you know, sometimes in, in the season, you know, they give us some pushback if, if we ask them to do too many interviews over a certain span of time, or if we ask them to do too much, but, but once we got in there, it was, you know, Hey, what do you need? You know, basically whatever we needed from them, they were available. Um, and I think they understood the bigger picture. Um, and it helped that, you know, all sides were able to adapt and adjust, you know, it was, it was different for everyone. It was different for the writers. It was different for the players. It was different for TV. It was different for PR. Um, but, you know, everybody understood that everybody worked together. Um, and, you know, from, from a media and coverage perspective, I think that it went about as good as it could go. I have uh, a number of other questions I could ask, but we, we do want to open up to some student questions. So Jill and Stacy and Emma, if there are any of those out there, we'd be happy to, the panel would be happy to take them. Well, sure. Um, this question was actually pre-submitted by Noah, and this is to Jen or Evan, whom, whoever wants to take it. Um, the question is, what one tip or word of advice would you give to someone who is looking to work in the hockey industry? experience uh, it's almost impossible unless you get some experience prior like entry-level jobs um, team sports experience is so helpful and I don't just mean hockey I mean Evan I think you would agree that we get people who have you know collegiate sports backgrounds maybe they're working in an SID office and covering volleyball and baseball you know and maybe not like the bigger sports of basketball and baseball and football but they are learning what you need to learn and it's so important um i think we've both have volunteered to do things when we were younger um not understanding if or what it you know understanding if it was going to amount to anything but you know obviously it did and we give you the advice because it's the way it is you know when tom gave my background i'm the first person to say that's the most untraditional route to this job these nowadays like that i didn't work for a sports team i didn't start out in the minors you know, that's not traditional now. When I started, there weren't tens of thousands of kids going to school for sports. And it's definitely, you need to separate yourself from the get-go if that's what you want to do. Evan? Yeah, I was going to say, even the way that question was worded, you know, what, what do you have to do to work in hockey? Um, I would say, don't narrow yourself down to just hockey. You know, that's the thing is, you know, we're both at the Penguins now, but Jen worked for, for Disney, you know, and I, I worked at a, well, when I was in school, I interned for the Pirates. I interned for a uh, advertising and PR firm. Um, 
you know, I, I worked a couple other like part-time jobs, you know, like I, and like Jen said, the experience is so important. You know, it doesn't, I don't need to see that you worked for, you know, another hockey team to work for us. You know, like you can get, like Jen said, you can get that experience at the collegiate level. Um, and, you know, being in Pittsburgh, we're so fortunate to have a ton of colleges around, you know, Point Park Athletics. I worked there while I was, while I was in school and that's where I got my start doing some of this stuff. I was working baseball games, you know, I was working volley, like, you know, women's volleyball, you know, like men's, men's and women's basketball, you know, baseball, softball, all that stuff. Um, and it's just what it takes. You know, we have, we have Pitt, we have CMU, we have a ton of schools around here that, you know, that need help from students. Nothing and, can be beneath you. I'm sure Andrew and Rob yeah. can tell you about all the high school sports they covered before they were walking in professional locker rooms. It's just the way it works. And, you know, you have to be willing to make that sacrifice. And, you know, uh, Evan just said how many colleges we have here. Well, that also is, there's three teams here. So that's about eight jobs total. So you can't be focused on, oh, I want to work in this market doing this sport. You don't want to sell yourself short right now. You can always come back. What about Robin? Thank Andrew? you guys. How do we get to, uh, how do I get to be the next Rob Rossi or the next Andrew Stocky? Well, I mean, I was lucky. Um, I was 16 when I started uh, freelancing for the Associated Press, which is a wire service. Uh, the truth is there were more opportunities to get sort of professional mentorship at a younger age uh, then than there are now, but there are also more opportunities to do things on your own. Um, the one thing I will, the two things I will say, if you're lucky enough to run across somebody that shows an interest in helping you, grab onto them like your life depends on it. They will not, I promise you, they will not be shy about telling you when you're being, you know, too much of a trouble to them. Most people want to give back. It's, it's one of the real rewarding things in a job that can sometimes um, be very soul sucking. Uh, the other thing is, I'm just speaking from reporting. If you're going into reporting, um, here's my advice. Love reporting more than you love a sport. Anytime I talk to a young person that reaches out, somebody from Penn State just did this to me a couple weeks ago. They wanted to be a hockey writer and, and I told her don't. If you want to be a hockey writer, learn to be a reporter, cover things that have nothing to do with sports. Because um, as sort of Jen said, you don't want to limit yourself at a very young age when you're, when you're sharpening those tools. Well, I am probably the, uh, not the best example of how to get into this business. I, uh, I, I went to Ohio University, but I, I studied business. I didn't study journalism. Uh, I kind of fell into this once my uh, you know, business career kind of went belly up. And I have kind of learned along the way. And, uh, you know, I, I started actually in Hartford, Connecticut, uh, covering the Whalers, which was my, my childhood team. So I've always been, a, a, I'm, so I'm still a Whaler fan to this day. Penguins, Whalers just like this, but still a big Whaler fan. Anyway, um, what I've learned and what I try to tell young people is, look, you know, always, as Rob said, you know, open yourself up to everything. You know, don't focus so much on, I want to be a sportscaster. I want to be a, a sports reporter. Uh, be willing to do anything. And that's why I'm doing what I'm doing now. I, I do sports, but I, I anchor the five o'clock news. Uh, I, I'm covering politics these days. I'm doing a little bit of everything because I'm willing to try different things and not put myself in this box. So many young people come to me and say, I want to be a TV sportscaster. I said, well, you know what? Uh, that, that's great and all, but you need to be able to tell me a story. You need to be able to report. I don't want to see you doing highlights, give me a lot of stats. Tell me a story because what Rob and I do, we're storytellers uh, first and foremost. Uh, you know, we, we try to uh, not just tell you the stats and the numbers, but tell you about the people and, and the motivation and all that. So um, my advice to everybody is just be flexible and open. Uh, and eventually you'll get to the place that you want to go, as long as you're willing to maybe go in a different direction to get there. If I, if I could jump into as someone who's been uh, on both the reporter side and the communication side, to reiterate what, what Rob and Andrew said, I also, I think a lot of students don't know what they want to do and they're sports fans. So they, they study sports and they want to work in sports. Liking sports isn't enough. You have to like the work. What Rob said, reporting or whatever it is. If you like the work, it's the greatest job in the world. If you're doing it to watch the games or you think it's a, it's a cool job, you're, you're going to be out very quickly. So you have to decide that on your own. Do I really want to do this job or am I trying this just because I'm a sports fan? Because we weed out the pure fans very early. I'm sure mm -hmm. that works on, 
on your side as well. We can tell I, I, every semester in the entire Penguins organization, there are 10 to 15% of the interns who after about two weeks are saying, oh my God, I thought I was just coming here to watch the games. I didn't, I didn't know this. And, and you can see it. So decide that this is what you want to do and, and, and then go for it. Do you have, uh, there, there, one question that from a student, Rob, uh, uh, that you had, uh, referred to a little bit earlier. Uh, was there, this is for all of us, was there a time between March and June where you felt like your job would be laid off or you'd get furloughed? And how did you think of that? Because, Rob, you had mentioned part of this was people were worried about their jobs. Yeah, we were very worried. And, and, and you know, um, for those of you in Pittsburgh right now, it's, I, it's in a way been a very, it's been a great period of change. In the last five years, we've gone from having two daily newspapers uh, three television stations, a really thriving media market to um, not having two daily newspapers print. Um, and, you know, the athletic where I'm at now wasn't a thing when that all started. So, um, you know, we got a call one day that was like, hey, we got a company wide meeting and we found out that uh, some people were losing their jobs and, and everybody was taking a pay cut. And honestly, we were the lucky ones. Uh, because there were a lot of people that right when it happened, you, you saw companies laying off. And I sent, uh, I sent the Penguins, Jen and Tom, and I didn't think I put their uh, team president and CEO on the note, literally thanking them for um, the access because it, it did save some jobs. I'm convinced of that. Um, the sports media business felt like it was very nerve-wracking and topsy-turvy as, as tom joked i've kind of worked for everyone right um but people forget i was at one place for 17 years but things just change and then when they take sports away we all went and so yeah it it was very much and still is like i'm not gonna sugarcoat this like the threat of not knowing when we will start again has me as probably more worried than I was after the pandemic started because when the league shut down, I knew, well, they, they want to, there's a certain date that they need to start by to get the Stanley cup playoffs done. And they, there were all kinds of reasons they wanted to do that. Now it's a lot more open-ended to my mind because I'm thinking, well, I've covered this league long enough to know the revenue for the teams comes from fans in the building. And there, there probably aren't any owners that don't want to, next season to begin with some fans in the building and since we're not in this country really sure of when that's going to be you know I'm I'm still nervous and honestly one of the few things that keeps me from maybe losing my marbles about it I have many things I can lose my marbles about and there aren't many up there to begin with um is knowing that when push comes to shove the penguins are going to do what they can to help us out if for some reason hockey doesn't start in December or January. But yeah, it's, it's a scary time. One question we have uh, on the communication side for Jen and Evan, the question is, Penguins has been pretty busy with trades and player moves recently. A student asking, how is that different now during this period? Are there any differences because of what we're in or, or is it kind of business as usual? Business as usual, but social media is awful. <laughs> Later, I'm doing a social media etiquette panel <laughs> in the evening. Um, it's crazy, you know, it's pretty much status quo. We're getting the information as we normally would and putting stuff together, but it seems like it's this week was especially challenging because we had a beloved player being traded and had a no movement clause and stuff leaks, and then it just becomes so much more than, you know, a trade. and. It, Reminds you it's a business, but it's tough when you have a lot of people who aren't in the know speculating and making situations worse. And I, I attest that to, you know, not that we would be around people right now, but not having that communication like personally with each other as much as we normally do to affecting it a little bit. But other than that, it's pretty much status quo. Everything's the same, you know, there's like a chain of command of how we find out and when we put it out. So Nothing like that's really changed. Evan, do you agree with that? Yeah, I was going to say it feels it feels like a normal off season. You know, it's where you know you're you're maybe it feels, not. It doesn't feel like it's the, it doesn't necessarily feel like it's the off season, but things are happening. Yeah, 
Yeah, it doesn't feel like... Like, it doesn't feel like the drafts in a week and a half, right? <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, but like Jen said, everything's pretty much status quo, like the way that we, we get that information and, and pass it along and, and whatnot. So. Well, one, one final question for the students, because we're almost to, a, to an hour, and we wanted to keep it within an hour. We talked about the importance of dating experience. My question is, okay, how do I go about getting the experience during a pandemic? This is a challenging time for that too. So do you have advice on any, any of the four? I think that, I think that you're, you're gonna need to get a little creative. Um, I, I'll start by saying that the four of us don't have the answer, you know, because we've never lived it. We've never experienced it. And none of us can sit here and be like, oh, when we were in college, like we had to deal with it we did this, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't like that. Um, but I think there are ways to get creative. Um, I know that over the past couple of months, I've had a couple students reach out to me um, and ask to do like informational Zoom interviews with me. Um, I know there was a girl that went to Penn State that reached out and I actually hopped on two Zoom calls with her and she just sort of picked my brain about, about that stuff. And, you know, she was telling me that, you know, she was asking me questions about how I got to where I was and, and what I did and whatnot. And I thought that was really smart of her. She said she was reaching out to a bunch of different people, was just doing these informational interviews. Um, and I thought that was really smart. And she said that um, one of them actually led to an online internship with, I think it was like a minor league, uh, I don't know, some minor league team maybe, but you know, either way she was doing these interviews and it led to an online opportunity for her. Um, and I thought that was really smart. And, you know, I don't think all these, I don't think that all these teams are going to be hiring as many interns as, as they normally would, or if they are, it would be an online opportunity only, which is a little bit different, but um, on the flip side, everyone has the same playing field right now and has to deal with that. So, you want experience. My advice to you would be don't think of it as I need to have something published or I need to make a video that goes to WTAE or the Penguins or anything. Think of it this way um, if you want to be in a position of sports, uh, there are still sports going on at all levels. And the best experience you're ever going to get is not at the professional level, not at the college level. It's going to be at the lower level. So if you want experience, my advice to you, whether you're on the communication side or the media side is, you know, find some people. You kids are creative. You're online all the time. Find some people that are maybe playing youth hockey or are involved in a, you know, high school or something and start training yourself how to interview people, how to interact with people, how to build relationships. Even if it doesn't result in a story you can show somebody, it's gonna show when you get that chance down the line that you've trained yourself to be comfortable. Take advantage of the technology and the way you communicate with people now, because the truth is you have an easier time getting in touch with people than we ever did when I broke in. And there are more people to talk to now. Don't reach, don't think I need to reach out to an NHL player. Think there might be a player at, you know, a club hockey team at Pitt or something that you might be able to do something on. And if the story's good or whatever, you know, pitch it to somebody. That's also experience. When I say pitch, I mean, call an editor at a paper or call somebody at a newspaper and or at a television station say hey i have this story i wrote this story are you interested they may not get back to you but they will respect the fact that you just reached out to them and, and were, were assertive i think evan and uh, rob hit up the nose in terms of you know talking to us um and rob you kind of said people in this business want to pay it back or pay it forward and I, I i agree with that i mean you know reach out to us and talk to us i mean you can reach us very easily on social media I'm always happy to talk to students and try to give them some insights. Maybe I can't give you an internship right now, but we can talk about what I do. That way, when that opportunity opens up, you know what to expect and you know what to do. And you know, it's kind of interesting. Actually, we still have a, a program here at Channel 4 that despite the pandemic is still going on. Uh, we work with Waynesburg University and they shoot high school football highlights for us each week. And we are working with a group of students. Now we're doing it virtually, but they're with us every Friday night. We ask them to, to shoot the games at the highlights, write the story and send it to us. And we air it Friday nights and we credit Waynesburg University. So it's a kind of remote internship, but there may be that opportunity at Point Park with, with some organization, whether it be a team or a media outlet for you to still do work and still help out and yet not actually be in the building and doing the traditional internship. 
We're having some of the professors chime out in there here. Too, Tom. City Paper, Pittsburgh Current, yeah. um, all these sort of online things that exist, Patch, they are, they are desperate for content too. And if you have ideas, they will listen right now. And Community Access TV. Yes. Community Access TV is a great place to go. And some of the professors from Point Park have reached out during the middle of this. We have some professors uh, on this. Uh, Bob Durda from SAM wants uh, to remind students that there is now a virtual sports internship program at Point Park. Mm -hmm. so you can uh, contact Professor Durda at SAM. And uh, Dr. Conte reminds us that the Point Park News Service, of course, will help students publish their articles. So you can talk to him or go to Point Park News Service online. Uh, and so there, there are lots of ways to do it. One student also asked, can we create our own blog and publish stories? Yes. When I went to Point Park back then, you couldn't do that. There was no such thing. There was no such thing as an internet or social media or a blog. You had to actually get physically published in a paper. Now you can create your own blog. You can either write or you can't. Whether it's in the New York Times or just your blog, it's still something to show to somebody. So especially during this time, you can create your own video content, your own written content. And you can you can show it to people, and that's another good way to get started. So I think there's a, there's also a lot of help for your students at Point Park. But we're a little beyond an hour, so we do want to wrap it up and be respectful of everyone's time. Uh, to, to our panel, thanks so much, Rob and Andrew. Really appreciate your time. Uh, Jan and Evan, uh, working for me, you really didn't have much of a choice. But we were, no, I'm just kidding. We really appreciate your time. Uh, everybody everybody does like to to. to to uh, pay it forward, and uh, this group does in particular. So it's been very informative, informative for me. I hope the students enjoyed it. So uh, thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, everybody.